Hey everybody, I wanted to do a video here today about this product that's sitting here in front of me. This is the Blackmagic Design ATEM 1ME Advanced Panel 10. That 10 has recently been added to the name, for those who are wondering. It's not a new product. But, uh, yeah, I want to kind of demonstrate what this thing is, talk about what advantages you have by using something with it like this, and maybe even talk a little bit about who this is right for and where this kind of fits in terms of the right type of user and whether you might consider moving up to a higher end product instead of this. So first of all, I need to thank my friend Joe for wanting this to me for a weekend, uh, letting me take the time to really become intimately familiar with every little aspect of this thing and to produce this video about it. So with that said, let's jump in and take a look. Here is the top down look at this advanced panel. I'll take you on a brief little tour, but if you're already familiar with ATEM software control, you're going to find that this is actually very similar. The layout is actually quite similar. That was intentional. That's kind of the way that a lot of broadcast equipment is. Broadcast switchers are, are laid out just kind of standard. So no big surprises there in terms of the way that things are laid out here. But uh, we'll take kind of a quick peek over here at ATEM software control and you'll find that there's a lot of similarities there. All right, so the workflow here, very similar to ATEM software control, is kind of left to right. Uh, it's actually bottom to top as well. So these buttons down here are the preview row. So this allows you to see up to 10 inputs at any given time, and you're able to choose which inputs those are through the menus of the device. And pressing a button will select that as your preview source. In fact, so let me kind of let you see what's going on with the multi-view as I press buttons there. So let's go to the HDMI source. There we go. And the other thing is, even the small switchers tend to have more than 10 different video sources. So what you can do to get to the additional sources is hold down the shift key. So if I press that, you find that I've got a set, an entire second row, second row here of, of additional sources as well. So if I press this, this will select my playback uh, hyperdeck there. You notice that the button now flashes uh, there indicating that the source on that particular on the preview bus is part of the second row, the shifted row, on the switcher. And even when I let go of the shift button, that will continue to flash in green. But the moment I go to select a source that's on the primary row, it, it lights up solid. It does not flash. Another quick little tip here for those who are not familiar. If you happen to know where something falls on this shifted row, you don't have to press the shift button to get to it. You can actually just double tap. So if I can go back to my playback, double tap there, and now that playback source is now on preview. All right. The other thing I wanted to mention here is you, if you know you're going to be working heavily on that second row, you can double tap the shift button, and that will lock that into place and stay on that shifted row there as well. And then you can just press the button one more time to release that. Moving up, we have the program row. So this actually shows what is on the program bus. And if you wanted to, to cut on the bus, you can certainly do that. So I'm currently on HDMI input. That's the camera, the camera of me. It's looking at the camera that's shooting straight at me here. And if I go to shift and choose playback A, it will automatically cut to that immediately without going through the process of doing a transition. Uh, this, this row does not have the double tap feature because, well, basically if you did that, you'd see that first row source temporarily before you got to the second row. So if I, if I double tap that, all it does is go to camera one. It does not go to the shifted. That is intentional by design by Blackmagic. So with that said, I'm going to cut back to cam the, the camera on HDMI and move on. All right, so moving, I'll get to these top row, top row here in a little bit, but moving across, we've got a button here that's called Preview Transition. This is one of those things that I, I, I don't get the impression people understand very well, but it lets you see what the transition is going to look like in the preview window. So if, if you're not sure exactly what's going to happen, say you've got a couple different layers that are going on, a background with some lower thirds or, or other overlays that you're wanting to do on top of the video, and you're doing, say, say you want to do a wipe instead of a dissolve, and you want to see what that looks like without actually taking it live, that's what preview transition is for. So if at this point I press the auto button, you'll see that it's changing in the preview window without affecting the program. And that lets you see exactly what that transition is going to look like when it comes time to make it. So at this point, if I turn off preview transition and press the auto button, you will see that trans transition actually go live in the program window. So 
any point you can hit, hit the preview transition and get a preview of what that transition is going to look like. Obvious once you know what that means, uh, that button is called preview transition for a reason. We've also got buttons here to select the type of transition that's used with auto. So I'm just doing a wipe there and mix is kind of a standard one you use more, more often than not. Then tapping that button there, well, uh, tapping the auto button will take whatever uh, transition you got selected here. So if I go up to dip, that will dip through a color. So in this case, yellow goes through yellow before going to the next video source. DVE, tap that, and it does the DVE style transition. Um, so, so you're able to very quickly, very easily choose the transition there. And of course, down here we also have the cut button, which I mentioned earlier. Now we have the T-bar here, and for those who are coming from a world where they're operating using Companion, BitFocus Companion and the Stream Deck, you probably never actually use one of these, but this is just basically a way to do a dissolve at whatever pace you want. You can stop somewhere in the middle, pause, actually even reverse it. Whatever you want, you're, able, you're in full control of the duration of the transition there. And moving the bar from top to bottom or bottom to top does the same thing. It's just kind of the way that it works. So it's nice to have that physical control. In order to do that, you're able to control the rate at which one of those transitions takes place. All right, moving over here to the right, we have the DSK buttons. We've got DSK tie, DSK cut, and DSK auto. And there's two of them here for two different DSKs, downstream keys on your switcher. So auto, just go ahead. I don't have one loaded, but auto will do a fade in of whatever you have on your downstream key and then press it again and that will fade out. If you want to bring it on immediately without fade, use the cut button. And then the tie button here will do that DSK transition along with your normal transition. So if I press auto here, it would transition with a DSK on or DSK off. So that button is used to do that. Uh, the last button over here in this section is FTB or fade to black. It does exactly what you expect it to do. Uh, it's kind of protected by these uh, little plastic pieces around it so you don't accidentally bump it, bump it and pressing it again will actually undo it. All right, now, the uh, next thing we wanted to take a look at here is this upper row of buttons here. So this row of buttons, the function actually changes based on whatever you happen to be doing on the switcher at any given point in time. So right now, when I'm on the home screen, it doesn't do anything, but if I come over to and press key one on for an upstream key, all of a sudden this becomes an assignment for what is going to be used for upstream key one. And like these other uh, lower buttons here, preview and program, pressing shift or pressing and holding shift will allow you to access the second shifted sources. So I'm going to go ahead and choose playback A as my primary source there. And the other thing that is interesting here is this actually has a, a second shift as well. So if you press both shift keys together, that will actually give you a second set, another, another set of sources. So in this case, we could actually use ME2 or ME2 Preview as the source for that upstream key. Now, other sources will be available here depending on what you're doing, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But basically, that gives you a quick, easy way to, to assign the video source that's going to be included as part of your upstream key. Um, so you don't have to go waiting through menus or use software control to control that. Now, while I'm in here, I want to mention that as I'm making changes like this, the mode that's up on the screen, I know you can't see the screen super, super well, but the mode that uh, is being used, shown up here on the screen changes as you're doing different things down below. So in this case, I recently, I just basic, basically turned on key one as part of the next transition. And the screen here changed to allow me to configure uh, upstream key one. So I got a dial here to, to change the key type, uh, dial to change the fill source, and another dial to change the key source. So in this case, I selected source 11, there we go, source 11 as the fill source, and I, now I need to sort of select source 12 as, there we go, as the key, so I just turn the dial in order to access that, and now I have those two, two sources set up to do basically an alpha key, so I'm going to choose my camera as the preview, and you can see there that it actually has the key uh, over the top of it, upstream key over the top of that. And at that point, if I hit the auto button, it will dissolve on screen with the upstream key on top of it. And auto button again to take that off. Now, I want to make a note of some of the things that are going on here because this is a little bit confusing for new users. If I press this, you notice that key one 
is actually lit here. But in reality, what's going to happen is key one is actually going to be taken off of the program source. It's not going to stay on. So basically, the light here, the one, one, two, three, or four, that indicates that it's going to change state during the next transition, not that it's going to be on. So if it's currently on and the button bullet beneath it is lit, that means it's going to come off as part of the next transition. If I press, if I just press background to turn off the key button here, what's going to happen is when I do the transition, the key is going to stay on because the key one is not lit. There we go. So I do the transition. Let me, let me go to a different source here, so it's a little more, a little easier to see. There we go. I'm going to cut color bars, and if I do the transition, you'll see that the upstream key remains on screen after the transition. So I'll do that again one more time. All right, and if we want to take that key off, we'll hold down the background button because we want to include the background as part of the transition and then press key one as well. And then when I do the dissolve, key one will dissolve off and it will no longer be on. So that, at that point, if I don't want the, the key one to be included, just hit the background key again and then only the background will be included as part of that transition. A little confusing, but that's how it works. Now getting back up here to the screen, uh, I'm going to be talking about this a lot more a little bit later, but there's actually multiple pages here, so I hope you can actually see this, but beneath the word Luma here, there are six dots indicating that there are six different screens associated with the option that I have selected up top. So the option I have selected up top is MixFX Engine 1, Key 1, that's upstream Key 1 on the main part of the switcher. And if I, I there use these arrow keys, the left and right arrow keys, that will navigate between the different screens that will, can be used to configure the upstream key. So first of all, we have our, have our assignment, the key type, and then source assignments. We come over here, and then we can choose, we can set up the downstream keys, set up a, a mask for the Luma key on key one, turn the pre-multiplied option on and off, set up flying key to actually make the, that key move on and off screen and give it some animation. And then we've got some options that are associated with that animation as well. So that's kind of how that works. And uh, as I choose other options here, ME key one, key two, and key three, I've seen two, three, and four, uh, you can see the options for how those are configured down below. And as I navigate to other pages, those will be included as part of that as well. So if I go to key two here and then navigate over, this is gonna be controlling the mask for key two, not for key one. So. So there we go. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that there is a series of numeric buttons over here, which in this particular mode, it allows you to choose different different pages. So press it, press one, it goes to page one, two, to page th two, three, and so forth. So if you want to jump directly to one of these pages, you certainly can. Basically, um, if nothing at the bottom is lit in red, pressing the button navigates between pages, but the moment you select one of these down here below, so I'm selecting fill source for Luma key two, this actually becomes a keypad for selecting the source directly. And I know that the hyperdeck that I'm playing the lower third off of happens to be input number 11. So I can type in 1, 1, enter, and that will select source 11 as the fill source. And I come over here, press the button for the key source, and type in 1, 2, enter. That selects source 12 for, that, for, that, for, the, for the key on that as well. So you can do things very quickly. You can either turn the dials in order to make selections or type in numbers directly. The other thing I want to mention here is that there is a joystick. So let me go back and actually set up a, a key here. So I'm going to go to key one and set that up as the DVE type. And what that means is digital video effects. And the DVE type is actually something that can be scaled. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on. There you go. You can see in the kind of an upper right hand corner of your screen that there is now a window that popped up. And the joystick is actually used in this mode to control that. So I can use the joystick to move it left and right and up and down. But I can also twist the joystick in order to change the size. So twisting it left decreases the size, twisting it right increases the size. And that makes it really easy to try and get that into place instead of having to type on the, the keyboard, computer keyboard, the actual numbers that are used for positioning and setting the size on the key. So the joystick is there for that, but it has other purposes as well. Um, similarly, it can be used to position super source windows on, on switchers that have that. But if you happen to have a switcher that has a remote jack on the back, then this joystick can also be set up to control a PTZ or pan tilt zoom camera if it uh, supports the Visca protocol. So 
just one other capability that's there on that. All right, so um, there's four other buttons here that I didn't mention before. That's ME one, two, three, and four. So if your switcher is a multiple, as a model that has multiple MEs on it, you can use these to navigate between the different MEs. So pressing that, I'm now controlling ME two on the switcher. Let's take a quick look at some of the buttons up here in the left. These buttons are basically used to control what mode the screen is going to be in for navigation. All right, so we've got the home screen and I have four tabs here. So home, network, about, and profiles. Home just kind of gives, lets you see what's on preview, what's on program, and to control some of the different uh, transition rates that are set up. So auto rate is basically how long the auto button takes to, do, to perform a transition. DSK one rates how long the auto feature on the downstream key down uh, for, for one and two. And then FTB rate is the fade to black. So you can get to those very quickly. And again, you can either turn the dial here or enter a number directly on the keypad and press enter. It's, an, it's entered in frame. So if I wanted to do a 60 frame auto rate and type in six zero, press enter. And then when I do an auto transition, it will last 60 frames. So then we'll go back to 30 frames and perform the auto transition again. So it makes it very easy, very quick to get to those. Network is where you configure this, uh, some of the network settings for the switcher. So it's, it's an IP address uh, and other IP settings, and then the IP address of the switcher that you're controlling. If we go to the About page, this tells you a little bit about the switcher that you're connected to. In this case, I'm connecting to 2ME Constellation HD, and it tells me the software version of that. The last thing here is user profiles. So you're able to set up all the aspects of the, of the panel that you, that you want to use and then save those away. So basically, which sources you have uh, on your different buttons, as well as uh, other, other aspects of how the panel is set up. So you're able to save that in a profile for later recall. If, you, if you've got multiple people who are using the panel and they prefer to work a little bit differently, you can save those in, in profiles. Or if you've got different switchers that you're using on a regular basis with the, with the panel, then you can save your settings for each one of those in there. Okay, come over to settings, and then we've got some settings for the switcher itself. You control control the resolution for both the switcher and the multi-view. There is a place to set and view the time code. And then we come over to the next one. Uh, panel was referring to this panel. You can set br the brightness for buttons, labels, screen, and keypad. Uh, you can configure connections to HyperDeck recorders. And it's basically the same settings that are in ATEM software control. And there's three different screens for that. So you select which, paper, which HyperDeck you want to include which input is it's connected to on the switcher and come over to the next uh, screen. You can turn auto roll on and off and set the number of frames for auto roll, set the IP address for connection to that, that hyperdeck. And then the last one here is button mapping. And this is where you're actually able to configure what buttons are mapped to which sources on the switcher. So for example, if I wanted to take button six over here and then map that to a different input, come over here, tap this, to select button, I'm gonna hit set six enter to go to button six. It's currently mapped to camera SDI input six. And then I can either come over here and press this and rotate it or dial in the source number directly. So if I wanted to go 11 for my HyperDeck playback, I do that. And now button six here on each of these and now referring to input 11 on my switcher rather than six. I'm gonna go ahead and change that back. There we go. So now that's assigned to that. The other thing we can do here is we can actually set the colors for the button and the colors for the label. So if I change the button color here, you notice that this button is now flashing in blue instead of uh, just, just solid red. So if you wanted to have different types of inputs or a single input to be a different color, you can certainly do that. And then label controller, label color sets the the color of the label that shows up on here when that source is not active. A source that's active on preview always shows up in green. A source that's active on program always shows up in red. But otherwise, uh, see, I'm going to switch over, switch away. There we go. So now if I change the label color on input six and start to dial that, there we go. We're getting kind of a pink purplish color there, uh, blue, orange, etc. So you want to do that to give yourself some visual clues as to what you're controlling, you can certainly do that. All right, and then you've got an option here to reset completely to default. All right, keyers I kind of already went over. Uh, this row of buttons here controls aspects of the different transition types. So you've got your dip, DVE, sting, mix, wipe. Uh, these can be set here on, on these different screens. So mix, you can set the rate. 
wipe we can set not only the rate but the pattern so if I go here and select a wipe it's currently set to a diamond pattern so if I do a transition here you see that's a diamond but we can we can dial that in by dialing by turning the dial here so here we've got one that comes in from the, the top there we go and then there we go do a nice diagonal wipe so we've got some options uh, there we go and so again, you can also dial in numbers there as well. So you happen to know the number of a, of a wipe, you can actually just dial that in directly. Come over one screen over, and you can set symmetry and position values on the ones that's on the wipes that support that, and then come over here and set the border on the wipe as part of the third screen there. Come over here to DVE transition. Let me show you what a DVE transition looks like. So I'll select DVE here and press auto. In this case, it's just moving off screen, but you're able to change that uh, here on on the screen. So I'll do a squeeze to the up into the upper left. You'll see that it's, it shrinks the video source up into the upper left. So uh, you're able to control that. So then you can you can change the direction from the second parameter here. You've also got one here to select the, the rate as well. Uh, for certain types of DVE sources, you can actually control some other aspects like uh, the key source and whether it's pre-multiply key or and, and the clip and gain values as part of that. All right, come over here to, to Stinger, and go over to page two. So Stinger is gonna require a little bit of configuration in the software, because you so Stingers are used with video playback feature of the switchers that support that. So you, you need to assign a source. You can do it from the panel, it's a little easier to do in software though. So you're able to assign a source and set your trigger points, your clip duration, mix rate, pre-roll, et cetera, and then whether it's pre-multiplied, and if it's not pre-multiplied, be able to set your clip and gain associated with that so it's able to do the overlay. And again, again, you can set the source on that. Dip, again, just another transition type. You can set the rate and choose the color that it dips through. So if I choose dip, it's going to dip through color one. So I press that, and that dips through yellow. If I change that to color two, that's going to dip through orange. So we're able to change which of the predefined colors are you're able to do there. All right, next row, fade to black. You're able to set the duration and whether the audio follows the video. Uh, I, I personally like to have the audio follow. That way, when you fade out, fade to black at the end, your audio also fades out as well. Media players controls the two media players that are included as part of uh, the ATEM switchers. So media player one and two, you're able to assign a source here by dialing through different available sources that are in there. You can just rotate the dial or again, type in a number directly. And so media player one, media player two. And then you have the option to play a media player source if it's actually a, a series of still images, uh, essentially a video. Um, yeah, and then the last page, you're able to control a hyperdeck and choose which video source. So you, first of all, you can choose which hyperdeck of up to four you want to control. You can choose which clip you're gonna be playing with each one and then actually even navigate position within the clip. Come to the next page over here, and that's where you get your play, stop, previous, and next controls. And one additional page, you're able to see the length of the clip, how much of it is played, and how much time is remaining. You also get access to your jog and shuttle controls there as well. All right, next one, border. You're able to control uh, the different border uh, features that are available on whatever model of switcher you happen to have. In this case, this the ATEM 2ME Constellation HD has a border on the DVE. And that's the only one. There's no border on Super Source on this model. But here you're able to control the bevel style co and color. And you can come to the next screen. You're able to control the width of both the outer portion and the inner portion. I set softening parameters for both inner and outer. And then one more, you're able to control the opacity and the bevel position and how much that bevel is softened. So uh, able to control your different border parameters. Next we'll come over to color and this is where we're able to define what those two colors are. So this switcher has two, diff two different built-in color generators. So the first one the hue is 50, saturation 100, luminance 50, and the second one their hue 27, saturation 100, and luminance of 50. So if you wanted to adjust that, choose a different color or change its saturation or luminance, that's where you do that. We've got a blank button here that doesn't do anything, and that's not the only button that doesn't do anything. We'll get to another one of those here in a moment. Macro page. We're able to control the different macros that are already pre-recorded or actually even create macros in here. So if I wanted to create a macro that does transition to another to a source and then one second later transitions back, I could do that. So I press the record button. I'm going to tell it, yes, I want to overwrite my macro one that I've already got in there. All right, I'm going to make sure that I'm transitioning to, to, 
camera 9, which is HDMI input. I'm going to come out of here, go to the mix, set that rate to one second, set the type to mix, perform the mix, and come back over here to macro, and I tell I want to add a pause of one second, confirm that, and then perform the transition again, and then at that point I'm done with the macro, so I'll go ahead and press the same button that we used to start, and now I have that macro recorded. All right, so with that macro defined, I can come up here and actually press the play button, and it will do that transition to that source, and then transition back. So you're able to create your own macros here on the panel, which is far easier than doing it in ATEM software control. Uh, you're able to navigate between different macros here, and obviously I've got a couple of macros that have already been predefined. The one thing that I notice you can't do here is actually set the name. So if you wanted to name your macros according to what they do, you'll still need to do that within ATEM software control. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and delete this one. I don't need that any longer, and then we'll move on. But speaking of macros, though, you can very quickly get some macros by using the macro button that's down here. So I press the macro button there, and it turns all of these buttons blue, indicating that now you're controlling macros. I don't have any macros recorded in the first 10 slots, but I do have one in slot 11. So I press shift. It will now show that macro 11 is available on this first button. In order to play that, I just tap the button once, and it does everything. I don't have to navigate through any menus in order to get to it. The macros are available for easy recall. Similarly to how we had the option to get to additional video sources, uh, a second shift with the uh, upstream key earlier, if you press both shifts here, you will get access to macros 21 through 30. And so if I press this, it'll run macro 21. And so in that way you have access to 30 macros with easy button presses and not having to necessarily navigate through all of the menu. Next button, super source. So this allows you to configure all the aspects of the super source. So assign the different sources, control the size of the box, um, etc. So uh, if you had multiple super, super sources, you'd be able to choose which one you're controlling through the buttons here. This, this switcher only has one. And we have some presets here. I'm going to go ahead and apply this preset so we're able to see four sources up at once. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and preview super source uh, so we can out, sort of see what's going on there. All right. Now we need to assign some sources. So go over to the next page, the second page on there. So turn off the macro and now this row of buttons allows me to assign a source to the box. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to choose HDMI 9 for source 1. And then I'm going to go back to this previous page and then I'm going to choose box 2. And then come to this page to make an assignment there. You don't have to necessarily move to the screen. I can actually say if I stay on this first screen, this row of buttons is still being used to configure super source. So at this point, if I want to include my playback recorder, press shift, that's on input, input 11. So there we go. Now that's been assigned to box two. And I can rotate this dial to go to box three. Press shift, assign input 13. There we go. And now I've, I've configured the sources for the different boxes on super source very quickly. Uh, same thing, we go to four. We'll just, we'll just go ahead and put HDMI on box four as well. So from here, we're able to control the position, but again, we actually have access to doing this on the joystick. So if I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna change box one, and all I have to do is grab the joystick and move it around. So I'm gonna move it down here to the right, and then rotate the dial in order to blow that up and make it bigger. So it makes it way easier to adjust or even configure a super source through having access to the, all the buttons and the joystick here on the panel. We also have ways to set the crop for the box and to set an art source, which is basically the background uh, behind your eight, your, uh, your super source windows. Pre-multiply key is used for when you have a transparent key going on. And then uh, you, you have some other aspects here. These, this is for setting up border, uh, set borders and uh, shadows and so forth, which are not available on the switcher. But uh, you also have an option here to to copy the parameters of one box into another. So if you like the layout of one box, but just want to move it somewhere, make a copy and move it somewhere else, you can do that here. Next one, camera control. Uh, so we, this does not actually offer the ability to color correct cameras on the panel itself. If you wanted to do that, you either have to do that in ATEM software control or get their their dedicated panel specifically for that purpose. Uh, 
but you're able to choose which camera here you are controlling. So if you had multiple Blackmagic cameras that had the remote coloring feature, you'd able to be able to choose which camera is being controlled here. The other thing is worth mentioning here is I, uh, if you have a switcher, again, that has the remote jack on the back, you can press the button here, Visca button, and then use the joystick to control that, that camera. Now, this is, this is the one that confuses me a little bit. So there's actually a dedicated audio button on here, but at least with this switcher that I've tested it with, it doesn't do anything. So you're not able to control the audio mix for your ATEM switcher from this particular control panel. So if that's something that you're interested in doing, having a control panel specifically for audio, there are other ways of doing that. You know, the ATEM software control does feature the ability to interact with a control surface that supports uh, Mackie's Huey protocol. Uh, so if you're able, if you want to control audio with using a hardware control panel, you can get one that supports Mackie's Huey and then interface that via MIDI to your computer, and then you'll be able to control the mix. Uh, at least fader levels and panning and muting that way. And the last one I want to mention is AUX. The switcher that I'm using here is one of the new ATEM uh, 2ME Constellation HD models, which doesn't have AUX outputs on it. It just has 12 outputs that you can assign anything to. But you're able to control that here from this panel. So uh, it, that model has 12 outputs, and so I can control... There's, we've got one, two, three, four. But again, we can go to... We can go to different pages, so 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and then control the assignment for those sources down here. Uh, again, we're able to control the sources using the buttons that are here on the panel. So you're looking at output 1. If I wanted to assign that to the program instead of the multi-view, I press both shift buttons simultaneously, ME1, there you go, and now the, the window that you're looking at is now showing um, ME1 program output rather than the multi-view. If I go on, want to go back to, to, to multi-view, I have that mapped on input 19. Oops, there we go. 19, 1, 9, enter, and press that, and there we go. And now we're back to the multi-view on, out, uh, on output 1 coming from input 19. So very quick, very easy to do that, and I could do the same thing here by going shift. If I had that source assigned in one to one of the buttons, I'd be able to press the button to get there from here. So right now, if I wanted to go to Media Player Playback or Hyperdeck Playback, I can do that. But I'm going to go ahead and go back to MultiView so you can see what's going on there. Anyway, there you go. That is a crash course on what the 1ME Advanced Panel is capable of doing. Uh, for people who are wor regularly working with less than about five or six different video sources, this panel can make a lot of sense. However, if you're working with more than that and you need quick access to all of them, that's kind of where you start to run into limitations of this size of panel. So it's nothing against this panel itself. It's just you're going to need a panel that actually has more buttons that you can use to control those sources. So you get 10 on the main layer, an additional 10 on a shifted layer, but if you're regularly accessing more than 10, you can probably find very quickly that having to shift in order to get to those additional sources or even using the double tap uh, shortcut that's available might not be as convenient as what you're looking at. The other thing that's an issue with this one is it only, really only does control one ME at a time. So even though I can tap the button to control the second ME, I can't have ME1 on the lower lower buttons and ME2 on the upper buttons. So there's some, some inherent limitations there that if you're doing some more advanced production where you're using a second ME on your switcher, or you have more than 10 inputs that you're interacting re with regularly, this panel might just be a little bit too small. And, and that's the, the kind of situation that I am in and I've been, I'm in and why I've never invested in this myself because I do regularly interact with more than 10 sources. And I do use the second ME on my switcher pretty regularly, in which case this panel feels very confining and just a little bit too small for the type of work that I do. Now Blackmagic does certainly offer bigger ones. We can see that they have the one ME panel that we've got here demonstrated here today. They've got a two ME panel which basically doubles everything. And then we have the four ME advanced panel which does yet another doubling on top of that. So you've got 40 input buttons, four ME, four uh, ME's on each one. Um, 
So you get a lot more control. They've also introduced a couple other models recently, which are wider versions of the 2ME advanced panel, which give you 30 and 40 input buttons instead of just the standard 20. Uh, they don't have that listed on the website just yet. So anyway, if you're actually doing productions where you're never using more than 10 input sources, you don't use a second ME on a switcher, this actually can be a great option for you. Now, with that said, there are some inherent limitations with this because of the way that it's been designed. First of all, it's really only designed to control an ATEM switcher and if optionally a, con a connected hyperdeck uh, video recorder or player. Beyond that, you're really not getting control for, it for of any other devices. So if you have uh, anything else in your, in your production system that you want to automate control over, this is not going to do that. And that's where things like BitFocus Companion or Just Macros or Central Control come into play, uh, allowing you to interact with other devices that are part of your setup. This is really only going to control your ATEM switcher and a connected hyperdeck with some limited capabilities there. So if, if you find yourself in wanting to say, for example, control an audio mixer or another product that's on your network, this is not going to do it. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't get this. That just means that you're going to need to invest in other options on top of this in order to, to have that control. Now, that said, this panel can work really well side by side with other options that are out there. So if you've got a stream deck that's controlling BitFocus Companion or that or an X key is going to central control or whatever, they can be used simultaneously. So taking this uh, using this does not take the place of one of those as well. Having this does reduce the need to set up input buttons and transition buttons on those panels. And so you're able to get away with a smaller panel or have, a dip, have more functionality at your fingertips without having to switch to different pages, different layers by incorporating one of these. Bottom line is, though, it's really nice having dedicated hardware buttons to control aspects of your video switcher. You always know that pressing this button does this. You're not having to wade through menus, select different pages, uh, net, use a mouse on a computer in order to select a, a particular page, uh, move the mouse to find a particular button, whatever. You've got quick, immediate access without having to jump through any of those hoops. And in a high pressure video production environment, that is invaluable. You know exactly where the feature that you need is going to be all the time. It's a hardware button, you can feel it, you can touch it. It's just a better way to control your hardware. So that's about gonna do it for now. If you have any questions related to this or anything else related to ATEMs and other aspects of video production, you can leave those in the comment section down below or even better, join us over on Discord. There's a community there, it's not just me, there's hundreds of other people who are in, involved in video production and somebody will be able to answer your question and be able to do so very quickly, much faster than if you just leave a comment down below. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I do videos related to video production about once a week, thereabouts. And I do have additional videos available for those who want to participate in YouTube membership or Patreon. And you also get early access to videos before they become available to the general public without advertising as well. If you happen to run your own video production company, please take a few minutes to go look at my Crew Access website. It's actually a site that I built for running my own video production company. It does pretty much everything with with regard to helping you plan your production. So hiring your crew, keeping track of your equipment, billing, invoicing, uh, both your crew and your customers it handles both of those as well uh, interacting with your contacts it does a whole bunch of stuff so go and go ahead and take a look at that there is also a version that's available for free as well so you don't even have to pay for access to the site so anyway that's going to do it for now so thanks everybody for watching and have a fantastic day